98 Not Out, sponsored by Shepherd Neen, proud supporters of cricket in Essex. Van Morrison there, Queen of the Slipstream, and that has been requested by our first live guest of the evening. Uh, welcome to 98 Not Out, Mr Peter Moores. Hi, nice, nice, nice to speak to you, Dan. Peter, can you hear us nice and clearly? Yeah, a little bit louder would be good if there's a bit of volume yep. on it. I'll, I'll have a little play with it. Just let us know as it goes and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll twiddle a few knobs. <laughs> thanks, thanks. Sounds good. So, so t- tell us about Queen, Queen of the Slipstream. Why, why, why was that so one of your faves? It's just a sort... I mean, I got into Van Morris when... I, I played with a guy called Neil Lennon at Sussex. Um, and Neil was a massive... Uh, Van Morrison fan, as was Graham Cowdery actually at the time, was, they were big mates. Yeah. And Neil was playing it all the time. And yeah, I got into, into to Van along. I, I've, I've got, I've got four brothers, three sisters, so I'm one of eight. So, um, and I'm at the younger end. So I've got lots of different influences growing up, wow. um, from a bit of folk and a bit of rock and all sorts of things. But then, yeah, I mean, Van and since then, yeah, I like, I think it's, it's got a lovely, um, he's probably the best, best bloke at repeating the same word 20 times and it still sounds quite good <laughs> you know? do you have like at Nottingham do you have um, you know a, um, someone in charge of music on the team bus or uh, in the dressing room we had Laurie Evans on uh, a few weeks ago and he was he presented us with his CPL bus playlist which was uh, uh, quite eye opening interesting <laughs> was the word <laughs> Well, we, we, we take it in turns a bit because, I mean, the difference in music now, you can, I mean, some of the youngsters, some of the, I mean, obviously all the rapid music goes and whatever. Yeah. Um, but we love music, actually. The players love music, the coaches love music. So we actually quite, we like music when we train quite a lot because, you know, they, there's a lot of music and, and sport, they sort of go hand in hand. They're both, you know, with so much science goes on in sport, but, you know, sport is an art form. It's, it's creative. It's what it should be. So has a flow to it and music helps can help that not all the time but a lot of the time so um if, if that's the case if it's a one-to-one session the player can always stick his own music on because it's all on your phone and whatever now yeah. otherwise you get a bit of you get a bit of everything we try and mix it up a little bit so you know i think today over the we had it blasting out oh we, we mixed up from probably Pavrotti, Marshmallow, and, and um, <laughs> Brian Adams, I think, were all in the same house. So you get a bit of everything. <laughs> Sounds great. We'll talk about Nottingham in a second, but we, we can't not have you on the show and talk about uh, your stellar career. And, and a quote that I picked up today from Alex Hales, who described you as the best in the business. And, and just looking down through um, some of the illustrations of your career, it seems very, very clear that... Uh, bonding with players and, and getting the best out of them has definitely been one of your um, sort of signature points. And, and there's a lot of people that have credited you with, with, with actually getting them to literally raise their game and perform to the best of their ability. Um, what is the secret to that? I don't think there's any secret, really. I mean, I think generally, as a coach, you... You, you stand by people when they work and you encourage them to work because the one thing with, with any sport is to become really good at something, you've got to do quite a lot of it and you're trying to make it fun and have some energy and buzz with them to get them going. And, and, and generally, depending on the player, I think all, all coaches, you're trying to see what could be rather than what is. So you're trying to imagine what the player could be and get him to see the same. So... He's probably already a good player, but can he become the next even better than that? Mm. And that goes from sometimes it's an 18-year-old who's got some real work to do to sometimes, you know, it might be an Alex and can he see another progression of himself to move to somewhere else that he's going to be? So it's something that's in all of that. So we do it with our kids all the time. You know, you see your kids at five, six, seven, eight, and you imagine what they're going to be. I think a lot of coaching is, is you keep that alive for people. You keep their dreams alive. You help feed them and work with them and, and coaching's a bit about you pass on information. You know, I talk to a load of people about cricket. I love cricket. Um, and I hear different things from people. And sometimes you pass it on and say, you know, I heard one player say this, somebody else. And you try and help them find fits for themselves. They have to decide what it is that they need to do. But cricket's got sort of two things. Well, all things have, I think. One is the technique of it. And two is the method how you apply it. And often it's... From great players, you can find little things that they do that you can pass on to somebody else that simplify it for them, and then they work hard and 
and then hopefully they start to make it. It's got to be their work and it's got to be their plan. Your job as a coach is to help them try and find find the right one that fits them, I think. Peter, what, what's been the biggest changes to your coaching during your time? Because obviously you've been involved in coaching now for 20-odd uh, years. What, what, what's been the biggest changes? Well, the biggest change in the game itself? Well, for you, co- how you coach people. Or how I coach, yeah. or how I coach. I mean, the biggest change for me, I think, if I'm honest, probably when I, when I first started coaching, um, you probably want to prove a point a bit. You're trying to show you're a good coach, I think, which doesn't really work in many ways, as well as when I think you start to coach and you're trying to help other people prove theirs. So that's the coach's role, trying to create opportunities for people to prove their point um, and, and give them opportunities to do that. So... I think the more you coach, probably the less you say, you know, the more you watch and listen. Um, and, you know, I've found over time of coaching, really, that there's so many different ways to 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 play the game. What you can't get away from it, I don't think, is your basics. And I think that's sort of the basic things that go with a lot of movement sport, which are balance. Um, your rhythm and how to relax and play and your basic alignment as a player uh, in football, cricket, tennis, whatever, they don't go away. So you've got to help people get those good. But what happens with really good players and, and as they go up the levels, it's just some faster. Uh, and you try and help them simplify things. I think probably for me what's happened over time is you become better at articulating what you're trying to say um, and you have, you have empathy with a player. You, you work with them. And you, the coaches often, you know, you've seen a lot of good players and you know sometimes when a player's a bit short of something, you say, well, I'm not sure how you get there, but you're going to have to get better. Maybe it's playing off your legs. Maybe you need a better slower ball. Maybe you need to be fitter. I don't know. You, but you help them say, well, this is what I see. Um, the challenge is out for them, really. Then that can they step up and can they start to improve in a way that will help them play better about either that level or the real goal often is to go off a level and play internationally. So looking at your record, um, and I think it really is one of, of uh, getting players um, to perform collectively, to outperform as a team. You won the 2003 County Championship with Sussex. Um, you did that again with Lancashire in 2011. Um, and then when you were England coach, uh, twice you were England coach, but in the first spell, um, 2007 to 2009, um, coincidentally, your first um, series, I believe, was against the West Indies. Uh, it was, yeah. It was. And um, a 3-0 win uh, against them. I think it was it was a series from from what I can work out. There were, there were a lot of injuries and uh, episodes that affected both sides. But It, it, was, a, it was a transition, really. It was a, a lot of new players came in, didn't they? In that that's time, what I was going to say, yeah. Uh, I mean, just here, the names I picked out, O.A. Shah, um, Ryan Sidebottom, uh, Matt Pryor and, um, and Ravi Bapara as well, that were, were names that you kind of gave the chance and, uh, and, uh, and they took it. Yeah, well, at that time, you, we had a lot of new players. So, I mean, both times I took off for England, they'd lost 5-0 in the Ashes, which always causes a lot of players. Some, some retire, some were injured or whatever. And England were going through a transition. And in my life, actually, as a coach, quite often I've been through these transitions when players have turned around and you build a new team and Part of the challenge of that is inconsistencies, but that first time in, you know, you saw people like Matt Pryor, Graham Swan came back in, and we got Graham Swan, who then became a big player. Matt Pryor, Jimmy Anderson came back into the team, Stuart Broad got into the team. So a lot of players came through in that era who've gone on since. Alistair Cook really cemented himself in the side. And that was, it was exciting because, you know, some of these players, you know, my first intake at the academy, um, we had Alistair Cook in it. Um, Ian Bell was around at that point Matt Pryor so a lot of young players who then went on and played you know some played 100 test matches you know which is fantastic to see so seeing that development in players when they start it, it is really nice you know someone like Matt I, I started coaching Matt when he was 12 and when he was at Sussex uh, and he came as a young fella so uh, watching players go through those journeys is is lovely um, and both times really I've gone into England similar second time we had people like Moeen Ali coming in for the first time and mm-hmm. developed himself as a player and that sort of thing so you know Gary Balance who didn't did brilliantly didn't quite through Joe Root came back to the side so those transitions are always interesting because 
you're formulating new team. And you know, look at the England team at the moment, that batting line up without Joe in it. Um, it's got a feel of, a, of an inexperienced lineup, hasn't it? You know, yeah, that, yeah. Um, that then, you know, it'll do some brilliant things and it might make some mistakes. And I think you've got to accept that sometimes that as those players find their feet. The key is you're trying to invest in players you think that can go and have significant careers at international level at that level because I think often when you look at a player, their first 20 tests, they they can do well, but they won't normally. It's about 20 tests. The, second, the next 20, 30, 40 tests, they really start to find their feet and their consistency and then they move off into becoming a player like, you know, you hope some people like the, the, the Roots, the Stokes, the, the, the Andersons, when you see them really not just have um, the odd great game, but they really start to play in a way that, that dominates games and, and, and they start to get a team together that starts to really win consistently. Do we have a habit of discarding players a bit too early from their test careers like that? Because quite often a lot of people that come in don't ever get to reach 20 tests. Yeah, I mean, I, I think so. I really feel for Gary, Gary Balance. I think he got, it, it sort of fell wrong for him. He, he did brilliantly first game and I really liked him as a player. Uh, and he's and he's a he's not a technician. He's got this great skill to play very late. Uh, he sits back in his crease um, and he got labelled a bit as a blocker, but he's not a blocker. He's, he's a really good player. He's a guy who averages, you know, 50 at first class level. I think third fastest to a thousand runs as an Englishman, no. I think. So that was a batting at three, which was a great effort. And then obviously I left and and, and um, the coach changed over and Trevor came in and then suddenly he didn't play well for a couple of tests and he got left out and that really got the ball well, rolling against him. He, I think he got some a bit nervous about it and made some mistakes and he had flaws to fix like all players have. Uh, but it was a shame in some ways because it really felt like we found a very solid uh, player there who was going to do a good job for a number of years because at the time... As young players, him and Joe Root were the dominant forces, really, uh, had come into the side and done very well. So, uh, you know, I mean, if Gary will come back again, um, I don't know. I think it'd be tough at the moment. But, you know, like most things, he had his go. Somebody else has got the chance. So it's the chance now of people like, you know, Ollie Pope looks a really good player, Zach Crawley. They're good cricketers. They've got a chance to go in there and make their mark. I look at Chris Silverwood um, and, and make a lot of parallels between him and yourself as both of you being really, really good and successful county coaches and, you know, taking that onto the national team. And it seems to have been a successful formula uh, for, for both of you. But what are the biggest challenges or differences between coaching a county team and then coaching uh, the national side? Well, there's quite a lot of differences, really. Um, the pressure's obviously different um, on the players, really. I don't know. I mean, of course, it's different on the coach as well. But what you get with a county side, you get a, an age band that's probably somewhere between 19 to maybe 37, 38 sometimes. And, and they're all at different stages. So you've got young players who've just come into the game who are they're a bit wet behind the ears. They don't really know what's going on and they've got to go through a maturity phase. You've got Sometimes you get people in the middle of their careers who they're nearly gone half asleep and you've got to wake them up because they've sort of you know, maybe had a couple of kids and they're good players but they're not really firing because maybe their England ambitions have gone but they're a good county player and you have other players who are pushing for international honours and, and senior lads so with all that you're trying to piece them together and really you're trying to make sure that everybody's hungry to play wants to do well not just for themselves but for the team and the group internationally motivation certainly is never a problem. The, 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 the opportunities internationally are fantastic, really, because the feedback you get from the commentators and everybody, you can't get away from it. And I think what happens with a player in that, and maybe the, you, either, you either sink or swim a little bit. Uh, so the coach is slightly different in that you, you've got a much bigger selection pool. You can select from anybody in the country. At the county, you've got your 20 players. Hmm. Um, and I suppose really more internationally, you're managing a group of players. You've coached coaching as well, but you've got a bigger group of support staff, more specialist coaches. Um, and so it's slightly different. I think, uh, you know, you, you're a bit more hands-on at county level, uh, a bit more managing and coaching. I think internationally, look, Chris Silwood, I think he's done a great, you know, he, he's come in, he's, 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 he's already set out a template of what he wants to do. Um, but you're managing a bigger group of people and that, 
that's a slightly different dynamic than it is at county level. Um, both are great jobs. Uh, I, I do think that that you know we shouldn't forget that there is there's sort of two different styles. There's, there's there's sort of pure coaching and there's sort of managing, and and you can mix the two together. We see it in other sports. You know, in, in football, you probably see Pep Guardiola who coaches and manages at the same time, to so maybe somebody else who's looks like he maybe stands off a bit more and he just manages the group. So I think, you know, that I think has always been in sport. But internationally, pressure and more choice of players. And so you, you have to, you, you still want to be able to show loyalty to players internationally, I think, because people need time and they need confidence to go out and play. How di- I'm sorry, how difficult was it for you to get your way uh, as the international coach to get some of the, the new players you wanted in? Was it led by selectors or led by you and you know, sort of making someone like Owen Morgan captain, is, does that come from you or is it, it, do you always have to go to the selectors? It's always going to go through the selectors and sometimes things are very obvious and occasionally, I mean, the coach has obviously always got a strong say as is the captain of the team. Um, and at times you get certain things, that the mood grows for certain players and at times you get really fine lines on, on decisions. And so... And you don't get your decisions always right. I think that's something you have to accept. Um, but the, someone like, I mean, Owen was a natural leader and, and things had built up on, on Alistair at the time. And I think it became, it became a trade. It became a time to, to move. It was a really tough one, that. And that but that, I think the move, the selectors had, a, a, you know, were, I think were adamant that something had to change. The country probably was. But it was a tough one, Alistair, because... He was a much better one-day player than he got the credit for, I think. And the game had sort of moved on, hadn't mm-hmm. it? With four yeah. men out and the game had changed and the scores had got bigger. And it was in another, you know, it was, it was in a changing format. And we were going to a World Cup with a pretty inexperienced group of players, really. We still went to that World Cup with six or seven people who'd never been to a World Cup. So it's quite a different group. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's that the coach is a strong say, but the, the chairman selectors and the selectors... Quite rightly, though, they, 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 they've got their vote and uh, because um, that's their job and they've got what they think. So I think the relationship between the coach and the chairman of selectors and those selectors needs to be strong. There should be some really robust conversations going on about players because that's fair to everybody in the England setup, but also all those players outside trying to get in. Uh, and that, you know, it should always be a really strong debate because to play, to pull on an international jumper and sure then you should have you should have to keep fighting to keep it uh, and you know because that's part of the the respect that badge deserves now bringing it right up to date um you come to nottingham uh straight away you win the t20 blast for the first time in the club's history uh, memorable occasion that was um and with county cricket about to get going again um, what are your thoughts for the squad you've got? I see that there have been a few uh, uh, ins and outs over the close season. Um, but um, I've seen a few little videos of, of the guys training at Trent Bridge again and spirits seem high. Um, what are your hopes as, uh, as the Nottingham coach for this year and going forward? Yeah, I mean, I think we had, we had a really topsy turvy year last year in one way. We had, we, had a, we had a really good white ball season without winning the trophy. We, we, we lost two semi finals, so we got very close. Um, and we weren't particularly, we weren't brilliantly settled in what we got good white ball players and more bent that way. And we had a really poor red ball season. We've gone through this massive transition again because if you look at some of the players that have gone from the club over the last sort of 24 months, from, you know, the ex captain Chris Reid to Alex Hales retired from Red Bull, yeah. Harry Gurney, James Taylor, unfortunately, with a heart conditioner, Brendan Taylor, um, Ricky Vessels. You know, there's a lot of batting gone out of that. So we, we brought in new players because we had to. We also bring in through youngsters. So it's a new group of players. And it's still in that. And we've got what I think this season. We've got our points to prove to show that we're passionate about red ball and we're also passionate about white ball. Um, and we don't want to be seen as, as a white ball team. So the fact that we're now playing red ball and white ball, I was really pleased about. I think it's a good balance for members and for players. Everybody gets a fair crack. Um, and the, what we're, what I'm, you know, 
everybody starts a tournament wanting to win it, and why shouldn't you? And we, we'll be no different to that. But we'll keep it real. Um, we want to play really good competitive cricket and play it in a style and a commitment as a team that shows we are a team and we're tight as a group and we're ready to work for each other. And I think if we do that, we've got some good players. Um, and some of them will be, you know, some are youngest and whatever, and we've got different teams we can put out there, but it's competitive. Uh, credit to the lads so far since we've come back. They've embraced everything. And, you know, I want them to retain what I think everybody's got a little bit, which is when you've had something taken away, you really appreciate it. So really appreciate the fact that the opportunity to go and play cricket for a living. And also there's a sense of community that's sort of come with the pandemic. That let's keep that. Let's, you know, we're not just playing for us. We've got, you know, we've got family, we've got members, we've got, you know, the, the, the notch people. Let's make sure that we do everything we can to front up for them and show we're enjoying ourselves and we're going to play the best cricket we can. So I think that's what we be about as a, as a group and as a team. And you know, at the moment, everybody's got a spring in the step. Everybody's really excited about going to play. So it's a great place to be. You've got a great following. I mean, your membership up there is, uh, is really enthusiastic and supportive. And uh, Trent Bridge is always a good place to go and watch cricket. Um, and, and Nottinghamshire um, have, top to bottom, been really supportive of Brett and I and what we're doing on this show. So, you know, we thank you uh, for coming on. Uh, and, and we thank the other lots of people that have that appeared on this show. And we'll be watching really closely, Peter, uh, in this year and uh, and the years to come. I think it's a, it's a really exciting um, prospect that you guys have got. And with you in charge, then uh, I think it can only go one way. So thank you so much for coming on. Uh, we're really pleased to, that you found the time uh, and been really interesting talking to you. Uh, thanks for having me, fellas. It's been it's been nice to to catch up on it. You know, as I say. It feels it feels like cricket's times here again, doesn't it? With the yeah. test match started and stuff like that. That hopefully next week's weather looks a bit better. We've all been dodging showers a bit, but yeah, <laughs> it's, uh, nice to, nice to talk cricket for a bit. Excellent. Well, Cheers, we Peter. wish you all the best, Peter, and take care. Thank you very much. Right, take care. Cheers. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.